Before I get started, I have a short detour to Blaney's. Mid-1990s, the Basement Blues Club, long gone in the Westport area of Kansas City, Missouri, at 421 Westport Road. I was new to dancing with probably less than half a dozen group lessons in swing. Well, something like swing. I had a mental map of a step pattern, no concept of structure in music. I knew there were beats, but it didn't mean I heard them. Count? Downbeat? What I knew was what the, when the music started, I started. When the music stopped, I stopped. The live group was maybe three or four people or so on a three postage stamp platform and the dance floor was just a two postage stamp area in front of the platform. A spilled beer sticky painted concrete area. To my right was a two top, a deuce, a couple sitting at a round cocktail table with a pitcher of beer and two mugs. I was enthusiastically running my pattern with a date when the guy at the table caught my attention. His eyes were big and he high-fived me. Hey, that's great, he gushed. Where's your studio? Do you teach? Could you give me a lesson? Could you give me lessons? That's when I made a fateful decision. I said, no, I'm not a dance teacher, but I could direct him to lessons. That was the night I saved dance by not teaching dance. Though I, and probably you, have known a few folks who did teach dance after only a handful of lessons, usually teaching in bars. Every time I tell that story, I imagine that pitcher of beer grows a bit taller than the last time. Well, that night is always in the back of my head. It is a constant reminder to me that every picture and video and written report we put out needs to show the best of the art. Each image is an education of what should be expected. The young couple who thought I was good enough to give them dance lessons, or probably him, needed a framework for seeing, seeing dance. They also wanted to be dancers, maybe only for date nights. But social dance, vernacular dance, is one of the hearts of the dance world. Most editors don't have any more of a framework than those two. Same for PR people. They tend to see dance in the limited role of decoration. Most sports writers don't recognize or otherwise value the superb athleticism in dance, partly because lifts and other moves which are made to look effortless by dancers and repeated exactly would have major sports figures panting and grunting and certainly never able to repeat the move exactly. Journalists give high remarks to grunts and panting. As shooters, we have a responsibility to represent the peak performance or most signatory movements of dance. Every time someone sees one of our pictures of dance, they should learn what dance looks like, and at its best, they should see the theme of that choreography represented in the picture or video used on the page. Every dance picture needs to educate. A picture of any arms and any legs and any motion doesn't work. Each time a dance company or a dancer puts out samples of their work, they need to show just how good the artistry is and how good their work is. You are selling your talent and your hard work for bookings to sell choreography and to sell tickets. You need to decide whether you are showing off your talent with a camera and your talent in editing or whether you are showing off the talent. Dreamy impressions and fancy montages look nice as long as they don't obscure the quality of your dancing. The best editing skill and camera skill sets yourself aside and shows the subject. Don't just play to other dancers who will see dance regardless, even if partially obscured by framing or effects. Some years ago, I edited a video between a set of performances. I meant to show off the dancer's precision, but when I showed it to a videographer who didn't dance and seldom covered dance, I realized I had needed an explanatory introduction. The videographer thought my edit was about my editing. Great motion matching, he said. I sighed. Not as I intended. You'll see the edit later in this video. One more note. I started programming in the fall of 1966 on an IBM Systems 360 with Fortran 4. The next summer, 1967, I took up photography and changed majors to reporting. I've carried a camera almost every day since, a surgical implant. I'm still programming including database programming, web programming, and even a third-party graphic program to convert AutoCAD files to PostScript. I would elaborate, but my point is simply a comparison with dance photography. In the meantime, between reporting for radio stations and a newspaper in New York State and the Finger Lakes, I've covered meetings after meetings, interviews, accidents, murders, fires, floods, fuel leaks, environmental disasters, and a range of general subjects. All of those are pretty similar boilerplate, regardless of subject, compared to dance photography. 
None of those needed the split-second intricacy, nuanced technical specifications, and constant attention of dance. When I say dance photography, I mean understanding dance in your bones, with choreography, dance histories, and shooting performance and production. Not poses, not shot lists, not hints, and certainly not motor drives, called continuous and digital. Merely bringing a camera to where people are dancing or setting up shop with a dancer in a studio doesn't qualify as dance photography. Dance photography is never easy, but with enough dance knowledge, you can easily get consistent and dependable results, good results. I always say and was originally taught that knowledge of your subject is the most important camera skill you have. That knowledge level is multiplied for dance. This is a specialized discipline which needs instinctive, aware reactions to best represent dance. Most other photography can be accomplished with knowledge of the camera, knowledge of framing, and minor information about the subject. Photographing dance requires much more concentration on multiple elements, each of which much must meet exacting specifications. It keeps me hooked. I've never found a subject which held my interest the way dance does. The challenge of dance photography fits my old journalism because every performance is a story of community. And dance photography also requires immersion into a world of perfectionists, where there is little or no leeway between the best you can do and everything else. Most journalists are parachutists. They parachute in, take a few quotes and pictures, hoping their lack of subject knowledge is filled in with standard interview practices, and hope that the raft of quote-unquote spray-and-pray pictures will have something usable. Dance is much more intricate than the standard journalistic methods can cover. That is a good part of the reason for this video. With luck, it will produce more actual dance photographers rather than shooters who show up and point a camera then click away fiercely. None of the non-dancing photographers is trying to do a bad job. They are busting their sensitive little selves. But their work is not likely to get that well received because dance is not their specialty and the published results may well embarrass the dancers. I've had earfuls after following local quote-unquote top flight photojournalists in a studio. I'm hoping this video can be a reference for them, as well as dancers. You need to maintain a fine edge that you can never let down on. You need to consistently and continually shoot the exact and tiny moments repeatedly, every time. My personal tell is that every time I get a sense that my shooting is extremely easy, almost off the cuff easy, I stop and reset. That kind of easy means I'm losing attention and doing, doing mediocre work. So I do a quick mental and camera settings inventory, then go again. For me, every dance picture is a story in a moment I call transitive. I've named the type of shot after a transitive verb, which is a verb which requires completion. This is not the posed action shot you see on so many calendars and covers. For these, the shooter and camera are in a photo studio setup with powerful electronic flash while the dancer or dancers jump on command making a simple jump look graceful. A transitive picture captures a delicately tiny and maybe exquisite moment, which is not only the instant that you've pictured, but the sense of having come from somewhere to this moment and on forward to a destination you can't see in this frame, but clearly imagine existing. The single moment transits imagined time before and after. And the dancer herself or themselves have on their faces not the look of someone running down the list of choreographed moves, what is my next move, but the full confident look of immersion in their character on a clear heading forward. This brings up something I and my partner Nicole have watched repeatedly from performers over the years. The confidence which comes with mastery of a skill set and is apparent in a choreographic storyline. Many years ago at a Fiesta Hispana in Kansas City, we both admired a mid-teenage dancer in a Mexican folkloric group. After the show, we were walking to her car when we passed a couple of very young girls, and Nicole thought one of them was familiar. Sure enough, she was the same young woman we had admired, only she was not a young woman in her mid-teens. She was a nine-year-old girl. Often we've admired the power and mastery of some young person, only to turn around later and see the same performer as really a typical youngster with her buddies. We realized our sense of anyone's age is only partially about years. Our sense of maturity includes a sense of someone's confidence demonstrated by competency in dancing. Dance schools are often a lot like one-room schoolhouses, something I never went to, but my stepdad and his family did on their farm. And my grandmother was a one-room one school teacher. The older children are enlisted to help with the younger children. Each group of kids has responsibilities, which are community responsibilities. This is well beyond the sense of a few chores. 
These are jobs, as in J-O-B job, which they take very seriously. I see the same in dance schools, also during school company performances. Often older children help to reconstruct choreographies they danced in as younger children. They take notes or record notes, and they hand down character roles, helping to train the next round of children in roles they had had in previous years. For that couple who wanted to feel free to dance together in public, trained dance confidence is associated with personal confidence. Dance steps you into a community formed by practice, what sociologists call a community of practice. Representing dance. Photos, videos, and screen captures by Mike Strong. MikeStrongPhoto.com Dance is more than steps. Photography is a creation of the moment. The most important camera skill is subject knowledge. Everything flows from that. Dance photography is not motion photography. Dance images are about the dance and the dancers and their community. I shot this sequence on June 5, 2010 of a Croatian picnic at St. John's Parish in Kansas City, Kansas. Frame by frame, here's the sequence. One, a mother dances around her young daughter, dancing her into the group. Two, mother and daughter now dance around each other. Three, the daughter dances around her mother. Four, the daughter runs off to somewhere outside the frame. So we watch the rest of the group dancing for a bit. And number six, daughter returns with a younger sibling to dance her, in turn, into the community. So that panel is how I see dance, as sharing, as handed down, and community. I will include dance technique and musicality as part of camera techniques and journalism, history, video, cinema, web authoring, and other side journeys. When I look at a stage, all those disparate disciplines contribute. I'm going to start off by beating to death, I hope. The error of using motor drive techniques continues to shoot anything moving or anything. I can think of no worse way to shoot dance efficiently than to get the right moment again and again and to use continuous setting. Always use single drive. In 1967, my photo teacher, Frank O'Neill, told us about being a new young photographer on staff at the Lincoln Journal Star. There was an old guy, quote unquote, using a 4x5 press camera while he and the other cameras, youngsters, had roll film cameras, had two sheets of film per film holder, and only eight to ten film holders in his bag or less. The old guy had 20 or fewer shots before he ran out of film. The young guys could crank out a dozen shots very quickly on a roll and then change rows while the old guy was loading another sheet of film, or two, or maybe three. Even so, the old guy consistently beat the more plentiful results from the new crew, repeatedly getting the front page picture above the fold. Well, the youngsters finally realized that the old guy anticipated what was going to happen. Two, knew how to get into position. Three, knew who to shoot. Four, knew what to shoot. Five, had patience. Six, knew exactly when to shoot. The old guy had fewer shots, but that was all he needed because he knew his subject. The old guy shot selectively. That was best for him. It's also the only best way for dance. We will start out with a simple sequence and a tap routine. Shooting in the music allows easier selection of those best moments. Depending on where in the music those best moments are located, we can use the musical count to position our shots. In this sequence of Billy Mahoney tapping, we want the danciest looking moments. First, look at the count. One, two, three, four. Those numbers are beats. There are spaces between the beats, ands or off beats. One, and, two, and, three, and, four, and, on the one, two, three, four, Billy is simply stepping. She looks posed as if she is just standing. In video, not a problem because we see the action. In stills, the action is not apparent. The off beats, the ands, give us what we want. On the ands, 
Billy is lifting and twirling her working leg. So we want to select for the ends. Here is a sequence as I shot it. One, click, two, click, three, click, four, click. Notice I made a mistake and shot one extra frame at count four. I clicked on that beat. But we can use the mistake to imagine shooting on the beat as well. Take the extra frame out. The frames we want are 32, 33, 34, 36. Notice also, there is no way, none, that you could use continuous drive to get this sequence. The message is, never, ever use continuous drive. And the 8 to 12 seconds this took, continuous drive would churn out easily 24 to 72 frames at 33 to 6 frames per second. Most of them are wasted. With single frame, you shoot fewer frames, but most of them are good. Overall, single frame will give you a better percentage of usable pictures. This method doesn't work consistently for all movements. Usually, regardless of framing, dancers are able to imagine what is not in the frame. Dance photographers need to show the full movement for the sake of non-dancers who cannot visualize all the movement. In some cases, a still picture can't do that. A cabriole is a jump where the dancer's legs beat together. A still picture of a cabriole shows either the legs together or the legs apart. A dancer seeing either picture has the rest of the movement in their mind. A non-dancer sees only the legs together or the legs apart. Our job as shooters is to make images which are a combination of enjoyment, reportage, and education. So, a few examples of the accuracy of shooting in the music and the benefit of attending rehearsals. Here are three frames of a folkloric dancer dancing with a machete. They're almost identical. Now three frames from three rehearsal dates of the same moment with the same dancer doing the same pas de shah in the same spot in the same piece. Again, three frames, three rehearsals, this time with the same two dancers in the same moment in the same piece. Then a Fox 4 host who gets a ballet lesson. He is taught changements, and I'm shooting him at the top of each jump. Here, Eric jumps with legs tucked under, then legs split apart. He repeats the set a total of four times. Next, we show the entire Russian part from three studio rehearsals with a different dancer, Danica, in the role. So each set has eight leaps, four with legs tucked under, alternating with legs split out. Again, each frame is one after the other. I love to shoot company class. Class is a warm-up for the dancers and a warm-up for my shooting. Here is an unbroken sequence of 25 échappé sautés, all at the top of the sauté, the leap. I think of these dancers' versions of jumping jacks. After that, I have three hops in Indian classical. Let's take a look in three successive frames, 90, 91, and 92. Here they are in the triple panel. Then the same moment across four rehearsals, in studio, in tech, dress on Monday, and dress on Wednesday. Followed by three dancers in a soda shah in tech from a side angle, preparing us for the same moment in dress from a front angle. My most basic principles are, you shoot what you see, you see what you know, you know what you do, your work reveals what you see, know, do, or have done. Embodied learning sticks with you the best. The next example shows a short extract from a photo shoot arranged by a PR department, who is clearly unable to see dance. It seemed likely less an opportunity to me in comparison. I'm always looking for good illustrations, either for class or for stories. So I shot video of one of their continuous drive shots and selected equivalent frames to approximate what they were getting. Then I shot my own set of stills, nine frames from the back of the house. They are frames 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Of those nine frames, five have soda shots. 28, 32, 33, 34, 35. 
Next, I show the piece from video that I shot in performance. Just the releve on toe section. I follow this with my performance shots of this section, one shot per releve, which I show with the frame numbers of all shots. Now that you've seen the single shots I took, let's look again at the same video so you can see what a small sliver of time each exact moment occupies. So, all 15 frames, the 13 releves, and the pre-positioning and others, all are good frames to use. Remember you have to be in focus, or, regardless of drive setting, the camera will balk. Timing, always listen to the music to guide your shots. Looking refines the timing, because the dance may be slightly early or slightly late. Here's the poster with all the single shots of each releve. Then, one of my early exercises in shooting warm-ups. Eight fortes, eight frames in the camera, no extra frames. Then, Ethne Tudor's Dark Elegies, about a village whose children are dying. There is one point in the piece where the dancer does four soda shots in four directions. She never repeats them. You're not warned about them. You have to learn in rehearsal where this comes, or you will miss at least the first leap and maybe all of them. This pair of four shot sequences illustrates how listening to music and attending rehearsals pays off photographically with these two sets of almost identical shots taken two months apart in live performance. And from two months apart to a span of 11 years. First dancer Laura Jones Walner in 2009. Then here she is in four rehearsals in 2019, 10 years later, and a park performance with a mask in October 2020. This side-by-side -side study example shows one more benefit from using single drive, single shot mode. When you're looking through the lens rather than a small television in the camera, there is no delay between the action in front of the lens and when you see it. So if you shoot a bit too soon, which I did here, you have the time, just barely, to correct it by taking another shot. This is impossible in continuous mode and very impossible with a mirrorless camera because of the lag time in the display. Hearing the author, hearing the choreographer. 1973 is when I first realized what it meant to hear the writer's voice and to hear the character. I had tried out for a Shakespeare play, but the play, for physical reasons, had to be switched out at the last minute for Loot by Joe Orton, a cynical, darkly humored detective play. It was the first time I'd had any kind of real role, and I wasn't sure I could memorize the script, but with work and rehearsals I surprised myself. I had it memorized. I thought that meant I had the play down. It wasn't until the last week of rehearsals that I found myself somewhere beyond the script. I heard my character, and I heard the author in the character. No, not literally like voices in my head, but a sense that had not been there before of the meaning in the memorized words. What amazed and fascinated me was that I was hearing, so to speak, the character I played and playwright Joe Orton's voice, even though he was already the late Joe Orton by that time. Our entire run was only for a pair of weekends starting Thursdays. It was a junior college play. 
but I would have gladly taken more time just to feel further the sense of those voices inhabiting my lines. I was fascinated. Something like that happens when you shoot a play or opera or dance if you really sink into it. That is one of the major reasons you need to attend rehearsals. Not only to get a specific technical move or notes on when to expect photo opportunities or how to video a scene. I call it building your onion. With the first rehearsal, you start to get a general idea. You look, you listen, and you take rehearsal pictures to get the physical feeling of shooting each work. The first rehearsal is your starting layer. Each subsequent rehearsal gives more layers. You start to see relationships in the way performers work with and relate to each other. You start to catch that with your camera. Then how they embody their characters and how the characters work with the other characters through the other performers. Each time you pile on another layer of observation and practice. You get this by feel, literally, as you hold and shoot the camera. And you will see it in your photos. The editors and readers may never notice the difference. The performers likely will. And more than that, you will notice the difference in the feel you have when shooting. And when you look at the pictures, the pictures will show what you can now see. Each time you return from a rehearsal to go over your pictures, you will see what you got versus what you thought you were getting, and you can adjust for the next time. Usually you need at least two or better three rehearsals before you are, quote, hearing, unquote, the choreographer or writer and the director of the production. This is what you're spending your time on in rehearsal, learning, layering, and correcting, and hearing. So some quick tips from practical experience. These are very short, just tips. Shoot musically. Use your ears. Listen for the beat. The dancers are in the music already. You will find their dance in the music. Shoot in a single shot mode only. Each shot should be selected. Attend as many rehearsals as you can, starting in the studio if possible to learn the piece and the dancers. If you miss a shot, it is gone. Go for the next ones. If you catch yourself shooting frantically to catch up, or you are not shooting on the beat, or you are missing shots, stop. Just stop. Slow down, think, listen to the music, breathe. See what the dancers are doing. Step back into the shooting on the music. Note. If you don't stop, you will miss more shots. No alcohol. Zero. No anything else like it. Dance movements are mostly short and fast. Very fast. Even a little alcohol will leave you watching the moments go by before you recognize them in time. No heavy meals. This will leave you feeling as if you can't quite catch up to the actions taking place. You'll be sluggish. Eat light meals or a salad. But don't starve yourself. You do need energy to remain constantly alert. Get enough sleep ahead of time. You will need to concentrate and to stay alert. Shoot the full person or full space or full ensembles. Forget the close-ups because you can't see dance in a close-up. Shoot the dance. Shoot the character the dancer is playing. Dance is very like mime or like a silent movie. Along with that, shoot the meaning, the theme of each piece, not just the spectacular moments. If you begin to feel as though you can't miss, that every shot is casually easy, you've got it down pat, that's a tell. T-E-L-L, tell. Stop. When it's that easy, you stop. It means you are not paying attention and your output is going to be mediocre. You need to keep an edge when shooting. So when it seems almost too easy, as if you're falling off a log, as if you close your eyes and shoot, well, this is the tell that your concentration is not fully focused. At this point, stop. Do a quick mental inventory, recheck camera settings, just as an exercise to get back. Then start again in the music. Hey, you guys should learn to dance like Phil. 
Oh, don't worry, we have all these dances down. Hey, you guys need to take some dance lessons. We'll get right on it. Changing. There's a new thing called rock and roll. <laughs> we, we don't know any of the dance steps. We'll show you. Come on, come on, come on. This is the hop. You just kick. Teach us how to dance with the lady. Yeah. Uh -oh. This is this is a new thing. This is a freestyle kind of thing. That way you won't step on the lady's feet and cripple them for life. Okay. You just just you just step and back. Step. Step and step back. And, back. Yeah. and then you just walk. Wait, you just stroll in. Yeah. yeah. Then you just step. A little more back from them. Don't hurt yourself. Yeah. Thumbs up sign. We can dance now, guys. Yeah. Hey, guys. Yeah, yeah, y'all got it, y'all got it, y'all got it. Wait, we teach us dancing to the rest of the guys. <laughs> What about your schoolmates? What did they think of you at eight years old and as a teenager doing ballet? Oh, there's some funny stories there because uh, uh, my school was academic and artistic, so I spent your school was what academic. So I see all my academic classes, math, uh, science, all these things uh, combined with my um, artistic classes, ballet, music, percussion, all these things. And uh, so I spent all day in school and. The bus dropped me off like a two or three blocks aw uh, away from my house. And every time I used to walk from the bus to, uh, to my house, my uh, older neighborhood friends used to bully me. And they used to call me all these uh, names uh, associated sometimes uh, with dancers. Um, and I got beat up several times. Mm -hmm. uh, but it took a little while for them to understand that what I did was uh, something to, uh, to respect and to uh, value. And how did that come about? Well, <laughs> I, I think after four or five years, I, uh, one day I said, you know, I cannot keep hiding. Uh, you can now what? I cannot keep hiding oh, from, yeah. from them. And uh, so I confront them and I said, you know, you guys think that I'm feminine because I do ballet. And you guys are these macho men people. So I'm assuming they everything I do, saying being this feminine person, you can do as well. So they took me on it. They said, okay, so show me something that I cannot do. And I jump and I did a double tour and the guys kind of look at each other like, oh, we can do that. And I said, well, show me. And they almost break a leg trying to do this <laughs> thing. And then I just jump and I did a cabriole and the guys were trying to A cabriole is where you beat the, jump and beat with yeah, the leg. beat the leg and, together. Uh, they tried to do it and obviously they couldn't do it. And then I said, okay, so there is one more thing, you know, you guys think that you're stronger than me, and I grabbed this uh, neighborhood girl, and I push her up over my head and lift her up, and they just couldn't believe it, and I said, now you try, because I'm this family guy, you're macho, you, you can do it, and they tried, and they couldn't do it, so after that day, that was the end of my bully days. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. You know, seeing is believing. <laughs> That's exactly right. It was educational for them as well. You know? Right.
90 to 95 percent of shooting is or should be knowing your subject. It's called subject knowledge. Shooting dance really requires knowing dance. The rest is knowing your camera, like the back of your hand. The camera can't shoot your picture. This is what a photographer does by framing, focusing, and pressing the shutter button at the right time, place, and position. The right camera works with you. The wrong camera will get in your way. Dancers and photographers start with different knowledge sets. Dancers already have 90 to 99 percent of what they need for shooting dance, knowledge of dance in their bodies. The other 1 to 10 percent is knowing how to use the equipment to get what they can see. Photographers can look at dance all day, but most don't really see dance, and most photo workshops are about the equipment. If I ever give a photo workshop for dance, it will have two concentrations. Concentration for photographers. Photographers will spend 90 to 95 percent of the time learning dance and musicality. Concentration for dancers. Dancers will spend 100 percent of the time learning how the equipment can record what they already know in their bodies. Knowing your equipment won't help you see or feel dance in order to shoot dance. It's just how familiar your camera needs to feel so that your camera works with you and doesn't get in your way. Everything happens in the music. Dancers always hear the music. When I started shooting in 1967, we were told that people were either verbal or visual. So, a photographer went out with a reporter on the newspaper. But the two jobs were separate. Except in my case, I was the only radio reporter I knew who went out with a camera. I took this picture of Roxanne Gupta in 1975 for an article in the Geneva Times, after Roxanne had returned from Hyderabad, India, where she had learned Indian classical Bharatanatyam style. I knew nothing about dance, didn't know what to choose or shoot. She directed because she also wanted pictures for a flyer. This picture was the one she chose. The editor chose this one. He didn't know either. At various times I've shown up at a dance company to shoot pictures after the newspaper photographer got the wrong moment, several columns wide. That's why you need to know your subject. There is no time to look at a list or review hints and tips. What you learn needs to be embodied from rehearsals and from practice. Even better, if you dance, even a little. Most photographers, maybe 99%, are in the same clueless spot as I was. My first real clue started with my first ballroom and swing lessons in the mid-1990s. To make my advice easier and quicker, sometimes I just say, shoot on the beat. Later, I'll get to transitive photographs, which, like transitive verbs, carry a sense of internal movement from one place to another. I prefer pictures which show someone who seems to have come from and is going to somewhere, rather than a static shot which looks like anyone jumping. So just look up Philippe Halsman, who perfected the jumping portrait in the 1950s. A dancer can make a jumping shot look more graceful. It's still a jumping shot. It's just more graceful because of the dancer. In the mid-1990s, working as a programmer, I began having trouble keeping track of lines of code in my head, something that had always been easy. Gradually, I began to worry. I don't remember how I stumbled onto readers, or when I noticed my reading was slightly out of focus. I do remember buying a pair of 125s at hy V, and suddenly my reading world sharpened again. I didn't connect it at first with my thinking or my concentration. But right away, those cleared up too. I realized I wasn't losing mental abilities. My eyes were losing the ability to focus in close. And with it, my brain grabbed more resources to just try to figure out what it was reading as I looked at my code. That stole resources from thinking. A similar loss of connection with strained efforts to clarify and identify objects on the screen happened when we add camera motion and text motion to our videos when we add editing instead. When you make the camera or the editing the actor, it has become habit to constantly move the camera. In this network clip, the camera moves too much to get a clear view. It's hard to look at because there are so many details, which makes this more suggestion of information than information. Let's view again, only this time I add a freeze frame to their video. Now we can register the scene details because we have time to examine the scene. Okay, so we're going to show some Zorn notation, and we're going to show what not to do, 
this isn't terrible, but it's bad. First of all, zooming in and then we pan across because it's tough to really see this very well and to get to grasp it. So instead of that, a better solution is to do something like this, which is where we show the entire thing at once. And then we crossfade into just the section that we want to show. Okay, so we can see everything there. And this way our brain can grasp it. Or the same thing here. Here is zooming in and zooming in. Our brain doesn't really have a chance to sit down and decide what to look at first. And we intend to look at her concentration over her notes. So instead of zooming in to get there, let's start with this an entire thing. And we're just going to crossfade into a pre-zoomed look. So now we can just get a, a grasp of this and our brain can get hold of it without having to jump through hoops. Or in this case, what we want to do is show off this section up here. We've got a tableau and we want to show Ron up here on the stairs. But this, we kind of lose our tableau and we also kind of have to decide what we're going to look at. So our solution then is to start the whole tableau with just Ron highlighted. And then we pull back on the highlight. We crossfade it out of there so that we can see the whole thing in context. Or on this kind of thing, where we have a tableau and we want to see each individual part and highlight it. So we just leave it in place while we highlight the parts. And then we come back and we show the whole thing. Give your brain a chance to work. Recording dance. Drawings, painting, and freezes. Still images and photographs. In ancient images, we get tantalizing glimpses of dancers. But no recording of the steps. Just enough glimpses to realize that dance was always an important face of culture. Every dancer has some sort of notebook in which she jots down her notes on the choreography she will be in and or notes for sharing later. These are text notes and sometimes stick figures or notations, but not formal notation systems. There are numerous notation systems for dance. Trying to do for dance what musical notation does for musicians. None are complete. All are difficult to learn and resemble the effort to learn hieroglyphics rather than musical notes. Even people who are expert in each system have to work to reconstruct the notations. In the 20th century, the two major notation systems came from Rudolf Laban and Rudolf and Joan Banesh. Laban notation and Banesh notation. Okay. Christine, the classes, as you know, always started with the opening stretches. And from what I've seen lately, they're different than what we used to do. A little bit. Okay. So now we, we start the arm, your second position, slightly turned out, not too much. The arm goes up, palm facing forward, and you get it stretched from the fingertips to the knee, all the way up, and the head focuses up. And then you just let that, let, let go of that stretch and stretch completely from this side of the body. And then up. And then both arms stretch out. Now you rotate, plie down, swing over, pull back, and then drop the head, let the arm swing free, come up, two, three, four. Computer animation. The first computer animation program for dance was written by a former Pomona College student who studied both dance and mathematics, Eddie Dumbrower. Eddie Dumbrower wrote D-O-M, DOM, D, capital D, capital O, capital M, in 1981 on an Apple II. Choreographers entered codes, which were then performed on a screen. Dumbrower was then recruited by Mattel to work on a computer baseball game. Dumbrower ported his Earl Weaver Baseball II in 2009 to the iPhone. Some years ago, Nicole and I taught a computer animation course for the dance division of the UMKC Conservatory. Using 3D animation to notate and animate choreography using dance form software. I remember that even dancers who said, the computer is not my friend, learned the software because they looked for what, in the software, produced the movements they knew already as dancers. All available in libraries of techniques in various styles, such as Vaganova, Shikati, and RAD. Once they had that connection figured between what they knew already and what the software provided, the dancers could animate their choreographies on computer. Handwritten notes provide a direct nerve-to-brain connection. 
They are slower, which requires that you summarize your thoughts when writing notes. Quotes can be found later. If you write down the elapsed time reading from the recorder, here a screen recorder, but if you are summarizing your thoughts, you're already kind of starting your story by the time you get to it. You're able to be able to type it out, note the time, see the elapsed time meter, at the bottom right of the screen. Then, if you see those times, you provide the recorder times. You circle the numbers, so if you do want a quote, you can go back and find it. Otherwise, the story will pretty much write itself as you finish summarizing. At the Geneva Times, we area reporters were issued stacks of newsprint, cut to 6 by 11 inches, a large pair of shears, and a quart can of rubber cement. We would literally cut and paste our typewritten copy. This is copy with markup, a combination of corrections and typesetting instructions. Being told, just give me your single best shot, is not really a compliment. It means the writer just needs some decoration and doesn't really care about your picture. Pictures and text need to really support each other and work together to complete each other. Comprehension and retention. Making it stick. Getting over. Getting across. Teaching. Writing. Making videos are all about transferring information and delivering content that is retained. For all the material thrown at would-be recipients, very little content is retained, and little or no checking is done to determine whether any information you presented was actually taken in. In the summer of 1967, learning to write for broadcast, for radio, we were told to, one, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them. Tell them what you told them. And they added, no indefinite pronouns. In other words, no him or her. Instead, Jean Jones or John Henry. My teachers further added, repeat the name of who or what you're talking about. No, the council. No, the city. Always the Eudora. Or Kansas City Council. Or Topeka instead of the city. Writing for radio, the assumption was that people would tune in or wake up part way through the story. The way you wrote the story had to compensate for the who, what, when, where, why questions more than once, both to catch up the listener who came in late and to affirm for all listeners the details of the story. Workspace. To work efficiently and in comfort, you need enough room to sit somewhere to move your hands for keyboards and mice or other devices. Devices need to fit your physical dimensions. You need space, real estate, workspace. We are not the size of our smartphones or tablets. For me, the tablets and worse smartphones are taking us decades backward as production machines because of their size. The first computer I owned was a Sinclair, about the size of a dessert plate with a membrane keyboard. It used a TV as a monitor, but it wasn't very useful. So, in 1980, I bought a Radio Shack pocket computer, made by Smart. It was about the same size as a large smartphone of today, a little longer and about a half inch thick, but with a chiclet mechanical keyboard. The screen was a single line, single line, 40 column LCD display. I did a lot of work on it and even programmed my own astrology programs, one for sidereal time and one for solar time. It had a printer which used two inch calculator tape to print on. It was great. I put a lot of effort editing my programs, one visible line at a time and only 40 characters visible, although it scrolled left and right for 80 columns worth. I loved it until the Commodore C64 in 1982. I finally had a real monitor, full screen, and a real full-size typewriter keyboard. I can't begin to tell you what a relief it was, and a revelation it was, to have a keyboard that you could comfortably put both hands on when typing, or how liberating it was to have that full-size screen and full-size keyboard. I suddenly realized what workspace really meant, and what a massive difference in production as well as precision. I never went back. The pocket computer was set aside forever. And monitor size. 
32-inch monitors are now my standard size. I have two monitors next to each other, two 32-inch monitors, and the display continues from one to the other. Even 24-inch monitors now seem just a bit cramped, although still usable. Graphics work and video editing need a large screen for accuracy with fine detail. Multimedia. Some words really need to be dethroned. I put multimedia near the start of my list. It is the word that caught on in 1966, then took on a life of its own, blotting out centuries of creative history from newer memories. Just about any presentation or show or web page or even printed page uses various media. Any of them could be considered multimedia. But for some reason, multimedia has become a separate term, elevating and separating it as a specialty. Art has always had mixed media, long before this particular word took hold. Just look at ancient painted statues, walls, and friezes in stone, accompanied by writing or ancient illustrations showing performers. In July 1966, Bob Goldstein produced a light show at a Long Island night spot, L'Orson, French for sea urchin. He titled the show Light Works at L'Orson. He was more, than, more or less repeating a Christmas party from the previous December for his friends in which he put together a visual jukebox with light effects manually synced with music, slides, films, moving screens, and curtains of light under spinning mirror balls. Well, any web page with text and pictures and links and a video embed is using multiple media or a PowerPoint presentation. Any stage show is replete with lighting, sound, maybe projections, flats, and even performers. I don't so much mind a term like multimedia, though I prefer it as descriptive. We do need words to communicate. But I have a certain aversion to using buzzwords, especially when there is no real definition meaningful enough to specify job requirements, equipment, or talent. I never show up with my multimedia thingy. I have multiple thingies, cameras, still and video, audio recorders, mics, lights as needed, though usually when shooting shows only the theater lighting is to be used. And afterward, posting pictures and information about the show on my website, delivering media files to the companies in the show. In other words, I am as multimedia as the next person. We are all multimedia. Presentations have always brought to the show whatever the performers were able to utilize. Look at these people shown on a mural in Pompeii 2,000 years ago. With this shaman in the jungle of South America recounting the myth of fire. Or these characters in the desert of North Africa using their hands as percussive instruments. More than 23 centuries ago, Aristotle applied rhythmic and spatial organization in combination for action, choir, movement, and lighting. Writing of it, we may regard all these colors as analogous to the sounds that enter into music. In the 1500s, artist Giuseppe Arsimboldo worked up a scheme of matching colors to musical notes, even to the point of getting musicians to play notes based on his color patches. Sir Isaac Newton gets in the mix, by associating the wavelength of each color on the spectrum with the frequency of musical notes. In 1725, a Jesuit mathematician, Louis Bertrand Castel, came up with the ocular harpsichord, 60 small colored glass panes with curtains that opened for different keys in the harpsichord. In 1754, he upgraded it so that a key strike caused a shaft to open with light striking the stained glass. The first actual color organs late in the 1800s were partly the result of research into synesthesia and color hearing. In 1877, an American, Bainbridge Bishop, reflected sunlight and later arc light through multicolored filters. Bright colors were used for high pitches, and low pitches used blurred colors across a wide surface. Australia got into the act when Alexander Hector researched sound into color, with each phrase corresponding to color gamma and each note to a hue. From Russia, Alexander Skriabin, where color and music shared equal billing in 1909-10 with Prometheus. From Denmark, Thomas Wilford, 1889-1968, and his Lumia, stands for light art, and Clavilux, which stands for light played by key, starting in the 1920s. Then Mary Halleck Greenwald, who even invented a new type of rheostat to allow more levels of control. But she, being a woman, didn't look like the public's idea of an engineer. I should also note she was a suffragette. 
Greenwald graduated in 1893 from Philadelphia's Music Academy and studied piano in Vienna in 1897. In the early 1900s, she is investigating how gradated colored lighting could enhance emotional expression in music. In a 1905 article, Pulse and Verbal Rhythm, Greenwald described the beat of a guinea hen as a master of the iambic form and of a glow worm. It glows rhythmically. Said Mary Halleck Greenwald, sunlight makes the world sing. Why shouldn't light help the song sing? Getting to media delivered on the internet. We'll limit this at this time to the web just to make sure we understand the ground. There were and are networks. There are methods to connect those networks. That is the internet, the network of networks. Then there are the ways to send information across the internet. The most common still is the web, or the World Wide Web. And there are web pages. The web page displays information. Within each web page can be links to any page or any other resource anywhere. The links using AA anchor tags form a web of cross connections which can be accessed by clicking on a link which is why it's called the web. The most basic code works well still and is very flexible still. Each web page is a text file with starting and ending HTML tags and each page has a header you don't see except for anything within the title tags which is displayed as the title bar or tab. The body tags carry all the visible content on the page Within the body are P paragraph tags, and to create the links which make up the web are anchor tags, A, href equals such and such web page and so forth, and each tag can have attributes. To open a link in another window, an anchor tag needs a target equal underscore blank attribute. That's all we need now. At this point, our web pages have so many features, bells and whistles, that we need to strip the pages back to these basics and really think hard about what is best for information, bandwidth, and developers. To illustrate, I will strip code from a few pages to show the size before and after, which is also the speed of delivery. On the left is all the code you need for a page. On the right is a typical page today. The content delivered is the same. Size, web pages are nearly always now, dozens to several hundred times larger than needed. Most of the pages I've stripped code from to get down to the display content are using only about 2% of the code which is loaded. This means heavy data charges for non-data material. Prime offenders are ad CMSs, JavaScript libraries such as jQuery, large CSS style sheets and download fonts. If you can write enough JavaScript to connect to a function in jQuery, you can also write your own JavaScript function without incurring the massive overhead from all the unused code. CMS means Content Management System, and the original idea was to allow someone to place content directly on the web without needing to develop content on a local host. However, CMS sites include those same massive overload of code so that they can offer numerous features just by a call to the libraries. But, like jQuery, this means keeping large amounts of unused code. CMS is also sold as avoiding learning curves from HTML editors. That's bogus. CMS has its own learning curves. They save you nothing. You would be better using Dreamweaver from the start. If you can run a word processor, you can run Dreamweaver. Today, the rage is to create content which fits the screen of any device, from desktop with a large screen to a smartphone. This forgets that the earliest HTML code already fit any screen. The term then was degrade gracefully. Today, the term adaptive is used when resizing and arranging from the server. And the term responsive is used when resizing and arranging at the client end. They are easily confused because they do essentially the same thing, but from opposite ends of the client-server relationship. The terms could have been vice versa just as easily. Before long, features were added such as images and tables with less size flexibility. Eventually, further features were added to take care of that. And we came around to today's bloatware. Developers got away with it because bandwidths kept getting faster, so the bloat was seldom noticeable. As COVID swung into effect in Kansas City, Missouri, the school district bought data space to handle lessons online. They ran out of space almost immediately, killing lessons, said a radio reporter, who apparently did not think to look at page sizes as a reason for the problem. 
Blackboard and other learning softwares are CMSs, so they add bloatware. In this example, you can see I've really cut the file size down, as well as the number of other files loaded into the page to assemble it before it is usable. This takes us back to the start of the web page when all pages would automatically adjust to device sizes. The only other thing we need are a few lines of CSS to allow images on the page to resize to fit the device. That's a brief visit to HTML code. I may do a separate video on just this item because it needs in-depth treatment. For now, just one more short note on web pages. No one comes to your web page just to see how clever you are. They come to your page for information. So we will start with the ultimate in information design which is readily available. Wikipedia. Not pretty? True, I suppose. But very useful and very usable. It is a fairly standard format for everything. It is open to everyone. Wikipedia is highly functional and highly regarded. Yes, you want something more decorative. But start with the maximum in information. Then dress it up. Wikipedia doesn't recommend the wiki model for all sites. Still, just to get your head in the right space, reaffirm what your site is about. Your site should not be an experiment on your visitors. Your site should present information you want to get across. Remember, clever is the enemy of clear. Now that we have our bearings, we can add decoration which complements information. You can use Dreamweaver or some similar dedicated editor. Please use them. Or even hard code your own. It's not as difficult as you think. Cheers. Film and video. There are a variety of methods to record dance performances, depending on the audience and on what you are recording. In most cases, when recording from a stage, you are recording the location of dances for maybe three purposes. Note that shooting and performance with a live audience means never stopping to repeat anything for the entire performance. So all framing has to be consistent for the hour or two or more that your camera will be recording. If you are on camera, you cannot wander or lose frame. You must adjust exposure on the fly. The lighting was not designed for your camera. There are no retakes. Once it starts, you are there for the entire bit. So hang on. Stay focused. It's a ride complete with bumps. Number one, as clearly as possible, show all the dancers on stage especially in recitals for schools where the parents are buying lessons and the DVD in order to have a record of their kid, even in the back row. Number two, funding recording, which means a sight line level on the camera, horizontal placement at the same level as the dancers and center lined into them. This gives you a video you can send with grant requests to show how this looks to an audience, even though the perception of the camera's video and the perception of a live audience will differ. Number three, recording placements, exits, and entrances and performance for reconstruction later. In this case, you might also need, certainly want, another camera placed at the back of the hall and high enough that you can see all movement on the stage and places of the performance. If you're shooting a stage performance with an audience, you can't stop and repeat anything or reset cameras. You're stuck for the entire span of time with all cameras you will have to maintain your frame without missing for an hour or more at a time. Usually I run two cameras on the sight line and next to each other, one to stick close to the action with a solo or a group and one to cover the entire stage front. You might also want a third camera in a high position to create a record for future reconstruction. About the sight line camera level, performers always project the performance in some direction on stage that is usually directly into the audience, straight out and level. Seldom ever downward or upward or sideways. The best spot for your camera is directly in line with the performer's projection. Several years ago, Louis Barr hired me to shoot two ballroom pros from Russia that he had brought in from a workshop, the Paramanovs. They gave an exhibition dance and I shot the exhibition. Because I was shooting, I was in front of people, so trying to be accommodating to the people I dropped down a foot or two lower than usual. Later, when I presented the video to Louis, the first thing he said was, what happened? Where is their power? Part of it, which it took me a while to grasp, was simply the difference between perception live and perception watching the image. The other part, which is why I'm noting it here, was that they were projecting straight out and level. My camera was below them, looking up. They were projecting over and beyond my camera, 
bypassing my camera. My camera should have been hit face on by their performance. Only then could I have the video images which could convey their performance. The crowd behind could easily have shifted a little left and right of, their, of me. Their perceptions live would have been the same. Think how many times you've looked around a pole or not sat in the exact center of a theater or in a balcony. Your brain makes the adjustment. But the camera's position has to be adjusted, substituting positional perception for a live brain in order to have a video which closely approximates an actual live audience perception. A camera and a live audience are not the same. Bringing a camera to shoot a stage production does not transform the live stage into a camera stage. No amount of wishing and no amount of shooting will turn a stage performance into a camera performance. There are moments of overlap, to be sure. You are, in large part, attempted to get across the same story. In a stage performance, the members of a live audience use their own perceptions of the character importance to decide which character looms foremost at any time during the show. I call it perceptual perspective. A camera performance uses camera framing and sequencing to do the same in camera. An image of the stage from the same audience position just looks distant and small. I call it geometric perspective. Stage locations go left to right on stage. Camera locations need to go front to back. In order to line up stage performers for their camera, most photographers will shoot at an angle along the stage. Photographers like the result. But directors don't because it doesn't show the production as envisaged from an audience view. Or this shot, which is actually one of my all-time favorites, where Kelani is doing her senior solo and her buddies are in the wings watching her perform. Film schools and photo schools teach composition and framing with a semi-codified set of named frames uh, for shooting Tommy, people. The, the frame names Ready? designate areas one of coverage. And two and All but one are for partial coverage. For dance, almost always use full coverage. In other words, throw away these designations as guides. At most, they should be relegated to descriptions of results. This is a case of more interest in cameras and devices than subject. Why do I even need to state this? Because time and again, indeed nearly every time you see movies or documentaries or most any dance coverage, regardless of how big the director or shooter, I see dancers being cut off. This isn't because dance is a special subject. It is because directors and shooters pay little mind to dance. Dance is used as just another set decoration. Often at the very moment you want to see footwork, some editor cuts to an extreme close-up or a cutaway to the audience. Just shoot close to the action you need to cover. That means show the full dance, not a section or a detail. For solos to groups to full core across the stage, frame the dance. Use uncut longer shots. Allow physical actions to follow through. Fast cuts just disconnect the viewer from the material, from any plot line and from any characters. Cuts disrupt your flow of thought. Before television was all widescreen, widescreen movies shown on television were either letterboxed or panned and scanned on the old 4 to 3 ratio screen. Turner Classic Movies ran a short video with several directors explaining why the widescreen should not be butchered with pan and scan. One more reminder of the difference between the way we perceive the world around us versus the world through an image. Looking up at a building, sides converge toward a point somewhere. In person, live, we know the sides are parallel. So we perceive the sides as parallel, even though our eyes see the convergence. A camera records the sides sloping inward, which of course they don't really do. They just look like that, but that is correct optical geometry. But looking at the camera's image, our brains don't perceive the sides the same as live viewing, as parallel. Instead, the inward sloping lines toward the top now become very obvious. To change that, we actually have to create an optically distorted image to feel natural when the image is viewed. In film cameras, we used a camera whose front lens could be raised while keeping the focus plane parallel to the building and to the film. Like this Crown Graphic Press camera with a front lens standard. The lens has enough coverage area that we can place the film in an off-center area and we can still get the same resolution. With digital files we can do something similar, though we lose a few image pixels, by adjusting the vertical transform as here in Adobe's Lightroom. Now when we look at the image we perceive it the same way that we perceive the scene live. Look again as we make a digital adjustment to transform the slanted vertical lines into parallel vertical lines, which are more accepted 
and in line with our live perceptions. Speed of sound. Sync to image. Usually it is a good idea to cover yourself with more than one source of sound, as many sources as possible. If you're using a house feed, one, you might never know when it might get dropped. Two, even after all these years, it will probably be mono, not stereo. Three, if the sound is canned, you will need a second source for audience sound, such as applause. Four, depending on who runs it, students or seasoned sound engineer, the levels may vary hugely. Students are more likely to suddenly hit you with high levels, splatting your sound. Five, your sound check is likely to be minimal, if at all. The shooter is usually the last to be considered. Six, the location of the feed may limit your position. Seven, you will need to accommodate house XLR cables. Eight, if the sound is live, the mics are probably over the stage or pit, which is the best situation. Nine, if the house keeps a good level on the sound, it frees you up from that task. If not using a house feed, you have to determine where to get your sound from. The camera mics, radio mics, mics hardwired into your camera or a mixing board to your camera back in the house, midway, on stage, on the apron, where? Using the camera's mics will pick up handling noise and other noise around the camera. Using radio mics means staying free of other microphone frequencies used in the theater or any nearby theaters, sometimes even all the way down the block. You can test beforehand, but sometimes a test that seems clear is only clear because the other mics in the area are turned off at the moment, only to be turned on around the time you start recording the show. That can mean interference on both sides. It also makes, means making sure your batteries are fresh. Rechargeable batteries are good if you have a dependable recharging schedule. Otherwise, you are better off getting a fresh one. Avoid hard to get or expensive battery types. Use double A's. Triple A's are small and expensive and don't have enough oomph. Same with nine volts, which seem to be an engineer's plot to cost you a ton in buying batteries that are also not as easy to get anywhere as double A types. Get double A's best for a combination of enough juice and enough low cost. Then there are the microphone types. Pickup patterns and sensor types as well as frequency range and spectrum are important. But a whole other discussion. For now, just use what you can get. After all that, you still need to figure out where to put the mics. The speed of sound is important for recording. Remember, the sound will reach your microphones after the image. Long after, by comparison. But your own ears and brain perceive live sound differently than recorded sound from the same location. As a live body in a seat in the theater, when the sound comes in after the sight, your brain compensates so that it seems sound and sight are right together. Unless the distance really is a long, long way, longer than inside a theater, your brain won't do the same compensation. So you have to make sure that the finished product keeps sound and action together. That means you will need to position your microphones next to the action and transmit the sound electrically, either via hardwired cables or radio. This is where radio mics will be essential. If you can't do that, and you should leave one's, one camera's mic open and on automatic volume as a safety backup, you will have to slip the sound track under the video track in the editor by the number of frames that you are out of sync. You can compute the number of frames as a function of the distance from stage to camera. In air, the speed of sound is usually given as 1,125 feet per second. It varies by air density, which is affected by altitude, temperature, and humidity, but for our purposes, 1,125 feet per second is more than accurate. Those corrections are too small to affect sound sync with video frame rates. Divide that by the number of frames per second and you will get the number of feet per frame. 1,125 by 30 frames per second is 37 and a half feet per frame. That's what we're going to work with. 1125 by 25 frames per second equal 45 feet per frame, and 1125 by 24 frames per second equal 47 feet per frame. Remember, in the U.S., we are using 30 frames per second. In Europe, it would be 25 frames per second. 30 FPS and 25 FPS are the target system specs for our product, television. So for each 37 and a half feet, call it 35 to 40 feet and you can eyeball it. The sound will show up one frame after its image is recorded, assuming it comes directly from the stage, not counting reflections or double source locations such as taps on stage and speakers in front of the stage or placed along the sides of the house. 
quick but not dirty solution is to place to level air mikes at the front of the stage either on the apron or at the sides and manually control the input level at the camera then as backup use one or two digital audio recorders one at camera position and one in the middle of the stage apron the front edge set to automatic level don't forget to keep one camera using its own mic set to automatic as an audio backup use every intermission to check batteries every time if possible especially if you are so sure of them you don't need to check normally you will do fine with the radio input from two lavaliers the type with pocket sized transmitter and a camera mounted receiver surprisingly well one more thing headphones never use noise cancelling if a board feed goes out your noise cancelling headphones will feed you the ambient sound I had that experience when noise cancelling headphones first hit the market so I wanted the new tech the ballet had live sound live musicians in the pit not canned so if something went wrong I couldn't throw in recorded sound luckily I had several other nights performances in the can and didn't absolutely need this particular sat at night use over-the-ear headphones with high passive sound padding isolation look for the sound isolation qualities the isolation assures that you're hearing the cameras output and not hearing the room this is similar to using an air monitor not a board monitor on a radio station to make sure that you are on the air and that you can tell what it sounds like to listeners don't worry too much about the frequency range of the headphones you want to make sure you can hear what the camera is getting or not getting so that you can either change the input setting or pull plugs and go to internal camera mics if the sound drops or something wrong gets fed to you I can't repeat this enough your headphones tell you whether the camera is getting sound so they have to be plugged into the camera's output not a separate board they will all have enough frequency range to handle that job nicely we're not interested in su super fine audio listening we are working we want to know whether the camera is working I may sound a tad paranoid about the sound that's not paranoia that's experience combined with old scars cheers then there's dance purely for camera. This could be shot on stage or anywhere else. Will likely be shot in bits and pieces to make the whole. You can use a single camera to get multiple angles because you will be shooting front and back angles that you couldn't shoot with a multi-camera setup without showing the other cameras. Here we set a single music track for our main track and we're having the dancers dance to the same thing separately and then matching on the track in the edit. You can shoot each part several times, stopping before going on and you can shoot each part from different angles repeating each so that you will never see another camera or set or stage or wings if you're shooting purely for camera you will have another massive advantage that you won't normally have in production shooting you will have all the lighting designed for your camera that means you can start the camera at optimal settings and then tune the lights to match the camera setting in production you are always last in line scrambling for the worst crumbs and expected to make it look the, as good as or the same as a full for camera video at this point the audience has been watching the video and as the dancers come into the camera then they come out from behind the screens the lights go up and the dancers finish the whole thing live Why White Men Can't Dance, the Coat Tree Music segment. Having a composer write music for your work is more than just handy. In the following bit from Why White Men Can't Dance, Phil Cassiopo's mockumentary, the two players dance around a coat tree separately and with each other. For practice and for shooting, they were using a metronome, which we were going to replace with music by our composer, Alan Myers. But Alan wrote the replacement music. He changed hands on the keyboard depending on who was dancing, sort of tonal themes. For Joan, he played with higher notes, the right hand. For Jake, he played with lower notes, the left hand. And when Joan and Jake danced together, Alan played using both hands. This is the kind of detail a composer brings that you would probably never notice watching. That is, Alan Meyer is not only replacing the metronome track with music, but supporting the scene by playing tone ranges depending on what is occurring on screen.
Okay, this time instead of laying a single track under video cuts and matching those cuts to the music from that main track, what we're going to do is cut the same track, only we're going to cut on the count. And this should feel as if we have a single uncut piece of music. Now that you will see a scene change, you'll see the actual visual change, but you shouldn't hear or feel anything change in the music. Oh, just one more note. Doing those backflips is Vanessa Gibbs. She's a grandmother and her granddaughter's in the background. montage and montage is good for creating an impression but not for giving details that you can retain also in this case we're not interested in trying to match up footsteps with the music what we will do is match up cuts with the music and then we just keep the music underneath and bring up the applause
be able to match the tempo in the song. Okay, hang so, on a minute. Just make sure we got sound. Okay. So let's make sure we that. got sound. Then, then Alan will match your tempo in a, in a similar song. Sure. Anytime.
and a brief introduction to multi-camera edit in Vegas Pro, which is much easier, um, and it's something I use to show off dancers. So here we take a look. What we're going to do is put in a couple of videos, and we're going to sync the videos up. These videos are each about two months apart. Same music, same canned music to the same piece, and same choreographies, different audiences, and very different stage spaces. For instance, the stage space is very deep front to back, at least 40 feet, and the other one is only about 8 feet. So I like editing in Vegas more, more than Premiere for certainly. We're going to look for some video. So these three women are ahead of Nicole. There's Nicole. She's about ready to enter. So we'll split the track right where she's coming onto the stage and bring it over to the left of our timeline. So we're going to look for an audio pattern between the audio tracks. Let's take one of the video tracks, put it up on tack, so we put the two soundtracks together. And this way we can compare them much more easily. We want to change the soundtrack, separate the soundtrack from the video so that we can pull out the sound out further in the front. Okay, so now we have soundtrack going underneath those first images and the titles and leading into our, our uh, full video. Multicamera is very, very easy in Vegas compared with Premiere, which is extremely awkward. Uh, in Vegas, you just highlight the tracks, go to the Tools menu up at the top, then choose Multicamera and choose Create Multicamera Track. So here comes Nicole. Two key. Press a one key. Press a two key. If you're an editor looking at this, you might think I'm doing motion matching, which in a sense I am, but I really think of it as choreographer matching. The dancer matches the motion. So we're going to fine tune a couple of cuts and crossfades, and we're going to blend a couple over so that some of them. You see two tracks at once. They're two months apart in two very different spaces. One space is only eight feet front to back, and the other space is 40 feet front to back, so she has a lot of different room that she can move in. And yet we can cut directly from one performance to the next and not miss a step. So enjoy. Not only with fading for, but it was so nice you got some of it for. <laughs> Once again, I need to make the point that while you can legitimately call this motion matching and editing, which it is technically, this is really about the dancers and that's what I mean to show off. If the dancers are not so incredibly precise, 
no editing I could do could possibly pull this off. There's an old misteaching about our sense of motion. For decades, film students were taught that movies produced a sense of motion because eyes retained images for a length of time on the retina. This was called persistence of vision. It was wrong for decades. Way back in 1912, Max Wertheimer published and described what he called five phenomena. Film schools still persisted regardless, so generations of filmmakers were incorrectly educated. The sense of motion on the right side, GIF, comes from the timing of the still photos on the left. It intersects with the brain's own timing sampling system. So here's what we see normally, and we're going to have an example here very shortly. We're going to let uh, Chow go through, and we're going to see this sequence again as if we actually had persistence of vision. If we did have images that stayed on the retina, this is what it might look like. The appearance of motion, by the way, is called apparent motion and we do not need to have anything hanging on to the retina leaving trailings like this. Film speed in feet, frames, and cinema. Film speed was first rated in feet per minute, not frames per anything. Yet somehow movie makers and videographers became fixated on 24 frames per second as the foundation of quote-unquote cinema. 24 frames per second is all but sacred. Today, video cameras often have a cinema mode. What is cinema mode? Video at 24 frames per second. Videographers will call their cameras digital cinema cameras rather than admit to using low-class video cameras. More relevant are tonal values and density curves, but tonal values and density curves apply to all imagery. When movies were silent, the rate of film travel for theater projectors was faster than the rate used to shoot the movie. And movie film came in one width, 35 millimeter. So silent film cameras usually shot at a rate of 60 feet per minute, while movie houses ran their projectors a lot faster to shorten the movies, which gave them more showings per day. Any sound was external, usually from live musicians. So no worry about sound pitch changing if you ran it faster. In 1926 to 27, when Western Electric's chief engineer, Stanley Watkins, was developing the sound movie system, he realized that any movies would need to work with existing projection speeds. There were a couple of reasons. One, film distribution would be easier if film speed matched existing projection speeds. Two, a sound projector running at existing speeds could also be used to run existing silent films. Three, therefore making it easier for theaters to buy the new projectors. So, back to sound cameras. They would have to shoot at the same speed as the projectors in order to maintain the audio pitch. Stanley Watkins needed to ask Warner's chief projectionist in New York City, 
about those film speed rates. Watkins was told that theaters projected movies at 80 to 100 feet per minute or more. So Stanley Watkins simply picked the number halfway between 80 and 100. Shooting speed would be 90 feet per minute. 24 frames per second was simply an artifact of an off-the-cuff interpolation, not by design. The speed in feet per minute was by design, which was merely existing practice when projected. Watkins' device for Warner Brothers was called Vitaphone and used a 33 and a third RPM record for the sound. Fox was developing something called Movie Tone, a sound on film system using an optical soundtrack on film. Years later, in 1961, Watkins stated that if they had really done it right, they might have researched for six months or so and come up with a better rate. Note, there are no frames yet. We still use the term footage rather than framage, which never existed. The only time rates and frames per second becomes important is when printing 35 millimeter film to other film widths, such as 16 millimeter for school and industrial films, or eight millimeter for home movies. You couldn't use the same 90 feet per minute rate for 16 or eight millimeter as you used for 35 millimeter. The common denominator speed that made sense if you're printing to smaller gauges was the number of frames per second. That's when frames per second came in. One other argument for 24 you hear was that 24 gave enough film speed for usable sound and was less costly than more frames per second. It was a back-formed argument, assuming that what exists now was designed so for good reason. Vitaphone sound was coming from a separate record platter, so sound quality didn't depend on film speed. Again, there were no aesthetic considerations. Any aesthetics were assumed already there in the art of making movies. By 1931, sound on film replaced sound on disc because it was so much handier to fix when film broke, even if the audio was not yet quite as good as the sound on disc. When film broke with sound on disc, you had to replace it with the same number of blank frames, otherwise you'd end up out of sync. With sound on film, the most a break could cost you would be a second's worth of out of sync sound. Fox had been looking at 85 feet per minute. That works out to 22 and two-thirds frames per second. So that's the rate we could have had if Fox had won the race. But Fox went along with 90 feet per minute to get wider film distribution in theaters for both companies. When television came along, it had a 4 to 3 format which copied the existing movie ratio. As television was expanding in the early 1950s, the movie industry invented widescreen to distinguish movies from television. As practical engineers, they figured out a way to use existing equipment with a small modification, a different lens. They shot with anamorphic lenses, which take in a wide horizontal angle, compressing it horizontally, to fit within a standard 4 to 3 frame. On projection, they used another anamorphic projection lens to spread the 4 to 3 squeezed image out to widescreen with various ratios, eventually standardizing it 235 to 1. An aspect of 1.85 to 1 was introduced originally in 1953. This is almost the current 16 to 9 aspect ratio used in today's high definition television. A basic rule of delivery has always been to deliver for the destination usage. Of these two pictures, the picture on the left is printed for a wall in a room. The print on the right is intended for halftone reproduction. In video, the primary destination is television. Television output is 30 frames per second. So many television shows were shot on film at 30 frames per second. Movies intended for the theater were shot at 24. To use a 24 FPS movie on a 30 FPS television, we have to make five frames of video for every four frames of film. There are two ways to do that, pull down and duplicate. One pull down method which combine a part of one frame with part of the next frame fabricates a new frame. This method makes use of a leftover from the start of television when phosphors couldn't stay bright enough for a full frame. Every video frame is made of two fields, first the odd numbered raster scans and then the even numbered raster scans. The downside of pull down methods is a ghosting as an artifact, or duplicate every fourth fra film frame as the fifth video frame. Just turn off sampling. You almost certainly won't notice when watching. It is painless and looks good. Use the method on the left side, every fourth frame duplicated. 
one of the back-facing arguments for 24 is that the slight motion blur enhances the set sense of movement. Well, shooters years ago would probably have given their eye teeth and maybe a molar or two to have the high-resolution cameras of today. The now lauded small amount of motion blur was neither desired nor designed. Mike Todd wanted sharper detail and smoother motion. He figured 30 frames per second would be a way to do this. So in 1955, Mike Todd filmed Oklahoma, and in 1956, Mike Todd shot Around the World in 80 Days. He shot each movie at two frame rates, 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second, using separate cameras. Mike Todd did get sharper images and smoother motion. What Todd didn't get was buy-in from theaters to add 30 frames per second projectors. Film at 30 frames per second does not turn into video, any more than video at 24 frames per second turns into film. Film at 30 frames per second does not turn into not cinema, any more than film at 24 makes it cinema. Mike Todd's Oklahoma is cinema, both versions. One was shot at 24 and one at 30 frames per second. Mike Todd's Around the World in 80 Days is cinema, both versions. One shot at 24 frames per second and one at 30 frames per second. Okay, this is me shooting with two video cameras and one still camera. Um, sometimes the video cameras are set up by themselves and sometimes they operate one video camera or the other one. And at the same time, I also, in the edit, I'm showing you the still pictures I'm taking when you see it come up in the video. So here we go with National Tap Dance Day in the Arts Bar.
had meant to do an actual history, but I'm way out of room, and that would be several more videos at least. In lieu of that, I'm going to give you a quick list of dances, names, types, genres, costume name dances, all mangled in a heap. It is actually a reasonable start, if only because starting with one type and then another limits your scope. You need a heads up regarding the massive diversity of dance. So, here we go. Take a breath. Concert dance, vernacular dance, popular dance, folk dance, theater dance, performance dance, ceremonial dances, Baroque dances, old-timey dance, dance, tap, tap dance, clogging, waltz, ballet, Italian, French, Danish, R.A.D., Russian, acrobatic, classical, Indian, classical, Persian, eurythmic, Japanese, traditional, swing, modern, jazz, original, and jazz after the mid-1960s, soft shoe, cakewalk, black bottom, Charleston, Balboa, Lindy Hop, flamenco, zombra, zombra mora, hula, cha-cha-cha, moonwalk, capoeira, house, punk, rave, disco, Bollywood, line dances, contemporary, rumba, ballroom, and rumba, Afro-Cuban, salsa, tango, American and international, tango, Argentinian, polk, Czech, not Polish, comes from Pulka, hip hop, Kobelia, Kochipuri, Bernatium, Belly Dance de Ventre, Melody, Melody Eastern, Egyptian, Urdanian, Mexican folkloric, Harabi Tapatio, which is the Mexican hat dance, Nayarit, uh, Mexican style, Broadway, Cumbia, Bachata, Chorus Lines, Can Can, Lombada, Frug, Shag, Boogie Boogie, Two Stop, Look and Jukin, Lockin, Poppin, Western, Two Step, Quick Step, Bolero, Salsa, Mambo, Foxtrot, Viennese Waltz, Jive, Samba, Paso Doble, Nightclub, Two Step, Casey, Two Step, West Coast, Swing, Merengue, Gazumba, Renaissance, Round Dances, Barn Dances, Irish Step Dancing, Irish Shanos, Scottish Folk, Bohemian, Scottish, Real Contra Dance, Mazurka Polonaise, which is Poland, Fandango, Seguid, Seguidia, Tarantella, Gallop, Highland Fling, Hopi Snake Dance, Grass Dance, Gourd Dance, Square Dance. And you know this is only a starting point, and these are just a few names. Most popular dancers and some others in the Western Hemisphere are a fusion of European and Amer African, often heavily African. This includes styles which first seem to have direct histories but quickly become complex piles of spaghetti, so to speak, intertwining back and forth and sometimes influencing other styles and in turn being influenced from the styles they influenced. Some forms go back thousands of years, other forms only a few centuries, and a few are brand new. In other cases, the terms used for something changed or were taken by another style. Jazz dance used to mean Lindy Hopper's tap dancers and their dependencies, such as Cakewalk and so forth, Charleston. That changed starting in the late 1950s, but the term itself didn't change until at least the mid-1960s to today's meaning for jazz dance. The history of jazz itself is also a history of varied viewpoints from music critics to authors to academics to entertainers to big binds and the supposed purity of small groups to concert and corner bar. Academics have their own story, while students of technology's impact on society with radio and phonograph recordings, going well beyond sheet music, as well as the need to just make a living in entertainment, determine which narrative is preferred for which audience. Recorded and radio music expanded the market for material requiring creation of new content. These two factors also shifted the entertainment market to big bands and concert events. Paul Whiteman, George Gershwin, who were rejected by Goffin and Feather and Gingrich as fake, Charlie Parker wasn't trying to create a genre. He was a young musician looking for a gig, learning the music he had to play, then some, putting his own spin on it. Salsa is Cuban music, but it wasn't around as salsa until 1973 when a music producer had a television show called Salsa. Tito Puente said the only salsa he knew was called Ketchup. Machito said it was the same music they'd been playing for more than 50 years. But that was now the marketing name. Both gave in and playing the same music now marketed themselves as salsa. You might think Spain equal flamenco, and flamenco means Spain. That is how dictator Franco marketed Spain. Within Spain, flamenco had been the music of the gypsy minority. After Franco died, flamenco hit a downward trajectory in Spain, but in the rest of the world it was appreciated as it grew. Hula has more practitioners outside Hawaii than Hawaii has people. The lines of what influenced what and why deserve far greater treatment than I can do here. I will leave those for their own video. Cheers, Mike. Hi, Lili Ue, no ho nani mai. Lili U. Ko maka. Po o hivi. Ko kuli. Ha ina.